Good morning. I am Bob Stein, the Executive Director and Associate Vice Chancellor of the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to our seventh State of the Economy program with our co-host, partner, and sponsor, PNC. While we can only be here virtually this year, we are so looking forward to being with you in person in 2022. So much has changed with the pandemic and elections since the last time we hosted our event. I cannot believe it has only been a year. To think 12 months ago, the coronavirus was only a minor part of our Converse presentation. How naive, naive we were of the challenges that lay ahead. I would like to thank Lou Sostello, Patrick Maley, and the entire PNC team for being our sustaining sponsor for more than 25 years and for helping coordinate this event. Thank you. We are delighted for our lineup of speakers to be presented here in person to you virtually. University of, of, of Pittsburgh Senior Vice Chancellor of Research, Dr. Rob Rutenbar, PA Department of Community and Economic Development Secretary, Dennis Davin, Allegheny Conference CEO, Stephanie Pashman, Allegheny County Executive, Rich Fitzgerald, PNC Regional President, Lou Sestello, and of course, our keynote, PNC Chief Economist, Gus Fache. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence, the IEE has a mission of economic development for small businesses and entrepreneurs in Western Pennsylvania. As one of the region's largest business, gr business growth and support organizations, the IEE gives businesses the power to prosper by helping increase their revenue, their profitability, adding and saving jobs, increasing investment, and also increasing the number of startups in the region. In 2020, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we were never, never held truer to our mission, and I have never been prouder of our team and of our results. In 2020, IEE worked with nearly 2,000 businesses, supported almost 10,000 jobs, secured $33 million in investment, and helped start 60 new one, 61 new businesses, which led us to be named the number one small business development center in the country out of, out of 1,000 by the Small Business Administration. We achieve all of this impact by providing consulting, education, and networking opportunities, even in a virtual environment and look forward to that continued impact for years to come. Before we begin, I must take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for today's event. PNC, Meyer Ankovic and Scott, UPMC Health Plan, at t Henderson Brothers, Cohen and Company, Wilkie and Associates, C-Leveled and the Net Experts. Thank you very much for your support. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker Dr. Rob Rutenbar, a Senior Vice Chancellor of Research for the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Rutenbar provides strategic vision, leadership, and partnership expertise that help University of Pittsburgh researchers and scholars advance their world-class research, scholarship, and innovation. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everybody. And thank you especially to PNC for hosting this opportunity to look at the state of our economy. You may recall that I last spoke with this group in 2019. Who knew that two years later, I'd have to wear a mask to get into the building and we'd be wiping down the podium between the speakers. This is just uh, one interesting sign of the new times here in Pittsburgh. This morning, you'll be hearing from some of the region's key thought leaders and officials for my few minutes, I'd like to share the perspective from the academic point of view. As you know, uh, we at the University of Pittsburgh consider ourselves active partners in the region's economy, and we hope you see our mark on it in several ways. 
um, from the influx of our undergraduate and graduate students as one of the top employers in the region um, and as an inspirational collaborator with industry, uh, especially in this region. But as you know, you can't say economy in 2021 without addressing the impacts of COVID, and we've certainly felt it at Pitt. A few months ago, I addressed Bob's Entrepreneurial Fellows class graduation event, um, also by Zoom, and I told that class that they succeed because they understand how to be adaptable, they frame their thinking in long-term goals despite short-term challenges, especially like COVID, and they know what to sacrifice in the present for an even more sound tomorrow. That sense of longevity is how we approach research at the University of Pittsburgh as well. Um, since 1998, Pitt has consistently ranked among the nation's top 10 educational institutions in National Institute of Health research funding. In fact, in fiscal 2019, we spent more than $860 million conducting externally funded research, um, including more than a half a billion dollars in funding from the National Institutes of Health directly, thanks in part to our particular strength in biomedical and health science related research. And then COVID hit, um, but our research expenditures were only down slightly in 2020 as our researchers scrambled to find new ways to continue their work. And here's where our legacy of biomedical excellence was recognized. You may have heard that Pitt scientists are collaborating internationally to help solve the crisis before us. Um, as part of Operation Warp Speed, we're conducting multiple clinical trials with a focus on infection and recovery. Just one of those studies has found that giving full dose blood thinners to moderately ill patients hospitalized for COVID-19 reduced the need for vital organ support, in particular ventilation. That's a big deal. And Pitt is also now one of the leaders in establishing the basic science that explains how the coronavirus mutates and creates troubling new variants. Our researchers throughout the university have had to make significant shifts to keep their research viable and progressing and setting up for long-term gain by reimagining their research operations in and out of their laboratories, by increasing the number of grant applications they submit in a normal year to plan for their work after we can all get back to whatever normal is going to be, hopefully in the very near future. We're all reimagining our mid-range futures now, and Pitt is no different. Our Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship is focusing on the future by making changes now. Um, and one of them is a personnel addition I'm excited to mention to you, Evan Thatcher, who is my Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, has just brought on board a local leader who some of you may already know. Joe Havrilla has joined, the, joined Pitt as the new Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. You may have crossed paths with him during his years as Senior Vice President and Global Head of Business Development for Bayer Pharmaceuticals, or while he served as a member of the Point Park University Board of Trustees. And depending on how long you've been here, you may even remember him as an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> Um, he has 37 years of experience in the healthcare industry, but uh, we managed to coerce him out of retirement to lead our new Office of Industry and Economic Partnerships, or OIEP for short. Joe and his team are our one-stop shop for industry and venture capital firms seeking to partner with Pitt. The team facilitates the process of engaging in sponsored research, technology licensing, and new venture creation. And in fact, OIEP works closely with partners like you to understand your interests and connect you with experts across our campus and facilitate the initiation and the management of mutually beneficial partnerships. And you can find a lot of details about how his team might work with you on our new website, oiep.pit.edu. So in fact, um, on the new page called For Investors, you'll see this interesting statistic. The University of Pittsburgh is ranked 18th among US universities for innovation impact. This distinction reflects the commitment I believe everyone on this Zoom call shares to drive and advance innovation to benefit society. But even more, to me, it reflects the basic philosophy of Pittsburgh to do well and to help others. So with that, I'd like to again say thank you for the opportunity to talk with you this morning. And with that, I'll turn this back to Bob. Rob. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Lou Sestello. Lou serves as the leader for the Pittsburgh and Southwest PA market and leads PNC's regional president organization, managing the regional presence across dozens of markets. Lou?
Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we had reflected this morning last year. It, this was the last large event we had. And we're typically in the Jim, James E. Rohr Auditorium, the Jim Rohr Auditorium over in, at the tower here at PNC. Unfortunately, we're not. Um, it's been a crazy year. I hope all of you are doing well and your families are doing well, uh, all healthy and happy and safe and also warm. Uh, and we finally seem to be through this cold snap. But <clears throat> on behalf of PNC, I'd like to thank Pitt, the IEE, for uh, having us here today uh, with the opportunity to be a sponsor uh, for us, what the IEE does here in the region uh, is so aligned with what we are trying to do, and that's driving solutions and helping our clients, um, you know, get through through the next step uh, of their financial goals. And the IEE has been well recognized as the best um, in class across the whole country. And Bob, congratulations to that. That comes from a lot of hard work and dedication, and teamwork, and you know, driving solutions for people just like we're trying to do with the bank. So. You know, really, really proud of what you all are doing. And on behalf of our clients, I'd like to thank you uh, for all of the support you've given us. It's really been a crazy year, one like we've never experienced. You know, you go all the way back to, you know, the nervousness that we had around this event last year, uh, being face to face when the pandemic was just starting to form, you know, all the way through 60 days later, us going through PPP and building a plane while it was in flight, you know, trying to get the monies out the door to support uh, all of you and all of our friends and making sure that they had the capital they needed to get through what we hoped would be a shorter lived pandemic, um, you know, all the way through, you know, social unrest, you know, through the election and, you know, the uh, events that transpired around there to where we are today going through the second round of PPP. Uh, now with a vaccine, looking forward to moving forward and, you know, trying to get back to what will be hopefully some sense of norm normalcy, but uh, going forward. Don't know that it's going to come back to exactly what it was, but some combination of what we're living today virtually and what we're experienced uh, or did experience uh, face to face. We look forward to moving forward into that next uh, chapter, hopefully sometime here soon. Uh, so on behalf of PNC, I just wanted to thank all of you for what you do with us, for the support that you give our bank, uh, for our employees. I want to thank all of you that are on the broadcast today, uh, what you have done in order to step up and help our client base and help the city of Pittsburgh and the region here has been truly phenomenal. So on behalf of Bill Demchak, myself, and our entire team, Bob, thank you for having us. Thank our team and thank you all of our clients for what you do for PNC. Take care. Thank you, Lou. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dennis Davin, the Secretary of the PA Department of Economic Development and one of our funders. Secretary Davin leads the Commonwealth's efforts to support business growth, strengthen the workforce, and revitalize communities. Dennis? Lou and, and Rob for uh, hosting this event in a new format this year, obviously. In February of 2020, this was one of the last in-person events that I was uh, participating in uh, before the pandemic shut everything down. And I'm grateful to be with you uh, today in this hybrid virtual in-person format. My hope is that soon we'll be able to start easing into more in-person events as vaccination becomes more widespread and we get this virus under control. I've spoken at this state of economy of the economy event for several years now. Normally, it's a chance for me to tout the economic progress we've made over the past year. But this year, of course, the story is a lot different. COVID-19 has hit economies hard all around the world. Here in Pennsylvania, it's no different. Our unemployment rate now stands at 6.7%. That's on par with the national rate, but about two points higher than last year at this time. After eclipsing 6 million job, the 6 million jobs mark and setting jobs records prior to the pandemic, our total number of non-farm jobs now is just over 5.6 million, which is approximately 470,000 fewer than in December 2019. Further, our labor force has shrunk as well. In 2020, more than a quarter million Pennsylvanians left the labor force, a number that was heightened due to the pandemic. 
The past year, we've seen so many businesses close permanently. We've seen so many of our communities face severely decreased tax revenues, throwing their financial situations into disarray and causing them to consider entering distress status through our Act 47 program. But of course, all that pales in comparison to the devastating human cost of COVID-19, with nearly 24,000 Pennsylvania lives lost to this deadly disease. But despite all this, I have many reasons to remain optimistic about the path before us. That's because the strengths that allow Pennsylvania's economy to surge prior to the pandemic are still here. We still have world-class colleges, universities, and here in Western Pennsylvania, higher education institutions like CMU, Pitt, Robert Morris University, Duquesne, and CCAC, and many others that are fueling the talent pipeline across many different industries. We still have a great location, offer great quality of life, low cost of living, and business environment, great business environment. And this attracts businesses from around the country and around the world here into Pennsylvania. Also, the diversity of Pennsylvania's economy, named the most diverse in the country just a year and a half ago by Bloomberg, beating Texas, I might add. And that's helped us persevere through the pandemic and will help us recover swiftly once this is all behind us. I'm also encouraged by Governor Wolf's most recent budget proposal in the upcoming fiscal year starting in July, which I believe puts us all on a solid foundation that will boost our path to recovery. The governor's calling for a fair tax structure both for personal taxes and for cor the corporate net income tax. He wants to lower the corporate net income tax, currently at 9.99%, second highest in the country, down to 5.99% by 2026. At the same time, he wants to close the Delaware loophole and shift to a combined reporting structure for corporations. He also wants to raise Pennsylvania's minimum wage, first to $12 per hour, then incrementally up to $15 per hour, something that I believe is long overdue and will help make us much more competitive with our neighboring states, all of which have higher minimum wages. I know that some of the business community have mixed reactions to these proposals and I understand that, but I think we have room for a nuanced <clears throat> and a good faith discussion about these proposals. And we're currently having that discussion with the legislature. So I'm looking forward to continuing those conversations. Also on Monday, the governor formally unveiled his back to work PA proposal, which is a holistic plan to help Pennsylvania recover. The plan is too large and comprehensive to discuss in detail here this morning, but in short, the proposal strengthens our workforce, breaks down barriers to entry, improves our education system, builds up our infrastructure, prioritizes reshoring projects, and so much more. Back to work PA is a $3 billion proposal that will be funded through a common sense extraction tax on natural gas that will ensure the Commonwealth is getting its fair share for the natural gas resources right under our feet. With the devastating job loss caused by the pandemic, Back to Work PA is a bold proposal to help those workers get back into the job market, help promote a more equitable, more diverse workforce, and get our economy back on its feet. I think now more than ever, we need bold proposals like this to get us back. And I'm encouraged by what Back to Work Pennsylvania holds for the Commonwealth if we're able to successfully work with the legislature and get this passed. We also continue to look ahead at the long-term economic implications of the pandemic and how we need to adjust our state policies accordingly. For instance, we've had conversations with economic development professionals here in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia about the future of commercial real estate. What that will look like as teleworking has expanded, the potential impacts that could have on our metropolitan centers and how we as a state can craft policies that align with these shifting trends. But that's just one component, and I'm eager to learn more about what's going on in the state of the economy from Gus this morning. And I, as I always take so much away from this event every year, and I pass on to my colleagues at DCED and the governor's office and the governor uh, back in Harrisburg. There's no question, we're in an extremely challenging time for our economy, but as I said earlier, I have many reasons to be hopeful. From the proven resilience of our economy <clears throat> to the likelihood of additional federal relief for businesses and communities in the next few weeks, that will be huge for us. Recovery won't happen overnight, but my hope is that working together with the business community, we'll merge from this pandemic stronger, more resilient, and more prepared than ever before, which will set us up for long-term prosperity, both here in Western Pennsylvania and across the entire Commonwealth. Thank you again for having me here this morning, and I look forward to returning next year. Bob? Thank you, Secretary Davin. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald. 
As county executive, Rich works with elected officials at all levels and with community leaders in business, labor, and philanthropy to help propel Allegheny County to commercial economic growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate everybody, uh, Secretary Davin, uh, Lou, um, the great partners we have in this region, um, continue to move this region forward. Obviously, this year is a year like none other, uh, and hopefully a year like we'll never never experience again. I can tell you, as the, the county executive and in charge of our local health department, the Allegheny County Health Department, we do see improvement uh, coming. Um, I like to say the light at the end of the tunnel is getting brighter and brighter every day. As more and more people are vaccinated, the vaccine distribution seems to be ramping up. Um, the caseload, uh, the hospitalizations, and, and thankfully the fatality numbers continue to come down and we get and people have more and more confidence. The other thing we've seen throughout this pandemic is it has put, put Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh region in a very good light. Um, we see a lot of growth that's going to continue to happen, particularly in healthcare in the life sciences. Um, we have a shortage right now of, of wet lab space, of companies that want to be here in our innovation districts, in places like Oakland, the Strip District, uh, Hazelwood Green, uh, Technology Drive, those type of places. Uh, we also see a growth in logistics coming. Uh, Retail is going to be different, uh, and where we're located has put us in a pretty good place. So places like the airport with distribution, freight handling, uh, those type of things continue to grow. Uh, we're going to see companies like Amazon and Walmart and some of the big Costco, some of the big companies that are looking to have warehouse distribution and logistic places. They see Pittsburgh and the Pittsburgh region as a good place. So we see a lot of uh, growth in that area. Uh, the construction industry seems to be going very well. Um, we still see our building trades that are that are pretty pretty well employed. Uh, the cracker plant continues to move forward. So these projects are continuing to move forward. People are learning how to do them safely. Um, what has been hurt the most, obviously, is the hospitality and entertainment industry. Uh, we just don't know how quickly that's going to come back. I'll be honest with you, I was concerned about overbuilding and oversaturation in the hotel business to begin with, even before this pandemic. And I think since this pandemic, we've seen a lot of troubles that, that are happening along those lines. Um, we do feel though that once we get on the other side of this, hopefully in a few months, uh, that there's gonna be a pent up demand for people who want to get out. Uh, people realizing that Zoom, while it, it has its place, it just is no uh, substitute for people being at work, interacting with each other, having meetings in their conference rooms, having sales meetings face-to-face, uh, -face, those type of things. So uh, while we're in this lull right now, we do see uh, as, as we move forward that those things will continue to move on. Uh, we also have a couple concerns with, with uh, some of our big industries that we run in the county. Transit, for example, levels are down about 70% as people weren't using the bus service and, and the light rail service, uh, the same thing is happening in our airline industry. So as these numbers come back, we, we've got to figure out a way to continue to make sure that that is part of the economic growth that we have. Luckily, this region has worked together. Uh, we've, we've handled this pandemic uh, probably better than most regions in the country. And a lot of it is the cooperation uh, that we have across sectors in government, working with uh, people like Secretary Davin and Governor Wolf, uh, and Secretary Levine before she moved on to the federal government, our partners in Washington uh, with our, our congressional delegation, our local folks, Mayor Peduto and his team and the municipalities that we work with and our corporate communities, including obviously PNC, one of our great corporate uh, leaders in, in, in this region. So we see good things coming coming down the, down the road and our universities continue to do great research, great work, uh, CMU, Pitt, Duquesne, all these, these universities that continue to, to commercialize their research and development work uh, that comes out of these universities. We're gonna continue to see that growth and optimism that we have in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is gonna be, continue to be a great place to live, raise a family, start a business, and do the good things we all know what we could do. So let's get on the other side of this. Good luck, and we're actually looking forward to hearing what Gus and his team have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate your optimism and uh, looking forward to that recovery. And I'd like to next introduce Stephanie Pashman, who's the CEO of the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. 
Cashman heads the Allegheny Conference and its affiliated organizations, the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, the PA Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh, and the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, which are all dedicated to the economic development and quality life issues for a 10 county region here in southwestern Pennsylvania. All right, Stephanie. Thank you. To everyone here in Pittsburgh, and hello and welcome to anyone tuning in um, outside the region. It's wonderful to be with you today. And thank you to PNC, of course, to Bob, to Lou, to Rob at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's nice, nice to always see the county executive and Secretary Davin. I'd like to start off by congratulating the Institute for Entrepreneurial Excellence on receiving the number one ranking in small business support from the SBA last year uh, in, in our hometown of Pittsburgh. With more than a thousand small business development centers across the nation, this is really quite an achievement. So thank you for all you do. So it's wonderful to, to meet all of you. As, as Rob said, I am Stephanie Pashman with the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. And I am going to make a couple comments on the economy, but mostly leave that to Guy and talk to you a little bit about our perspective on recovery. So what's the state of our region's economy? So here are some a few perspectives from some business surveys we do, some roundtables we hold, and some of the research we hold internally. So businesses in some of our key sectors, like tech, professional services, telecommunications, healthcare, finance, and actually even construction, are seeing demand improvements. 50% of them are experiencing these improvements, um, which is much better than the previous quarter. This gives us a helpful indication that most of our sectors are actually in a recovery mode. We certainly still see some hesitancies in robust expansion of capital investments, and obviously our suffering labor and hospitality sector. But overall, businesses are feeling more optimistic about 2021 and are taking advantage of low interest rates, rates to strengthen or expand operations. Consumer confidence in the overall economy remains fairly low, but confidence in personal finances and spending plans has actually been rebounding steadily since November, with about 45% of residents saying they feel more positive about their economic situation as opposed to only 30% in the fall. This is actually quite a signal to us that consume because consumer spending is a really important driver of the regional economy and an indication of potential recovery. In contrast, consumer confidence in the employment situation continues to trend low. 16% of our region's residents are feeling positive. Only 16% are feeling positive about their job prospects. Job recovery, especially in the segments of our economy, such as construction, manufacturing, hospitality, retail, arts, entertainment, this is where the pandemic disruption continues and remains the most important priority as we consider recovery. So how do we recover? Prior to the pandemic, we had a very solid vision that sought to capitalize on our regional opportunities. While the past year has certainly exacerbated our challenges, our vision is strong, it is sound, although slightly tweaked. To achieve a vital globally competitive region that delivers a next generation economy for all, we need not just recovery, we need robust economic growth. Growth is about competition, it's about competing and securing jobs, investments, and people. And we will only succeed by strengthening our advantages. We have an opportunity to attract significant investments in growth sectors like life sciences, robotics, and energy innovation. These are key verticals where we, this in Pittsburgh region, have clear comparative advantages. By advocating for smart policy, like improving our tax competitiveness and transportation infrastructure, we will increase our ability to recover even more quickly. And by working with the business community to improve racial equity and ensure this region is truly a place for all, we will offset some of the disruptions from this pandemic. But at the end of the day, we are focused on attracting more investments that create jobs, attract and train talent, attack, excuse me, attract and retain talent, and allow us to better support our communities and our neighborhoods while doing all of this in an equitable way. Because of the pandemic, we may not have a rosy picture of our economy today, but we are viewing the future positively. And that's because of our partnerships and our assets that are positioning us for a better future. Again, thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. And I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing Gus Fauché, the Chief Economist of PNC Financial Services Group, who will provide insights on the economy and as our keynote speaker today. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be here once again. I'm sorry that I can't be here uh, in person with all of you. And, and I know it's just around this time last year that we were all at the, the Tower of PNC Plaza. Uh, hopefully we can do that for 2022. We'll have to see how things play out. Uh, but obviously we're in a very um, interesting time with the US economy right now. Uh, and so, um, you know, this recession that we experienced in the United States in 2020 is very different from previous recessions that we've had in the United States. Uh, if you think about the Great Recession a, a dozen years or so ago, that was caused by problems in the financial system, housing market that spread to the overall economy. Uh, the bursting of the tech bubble in the early 2000s caused a recession. The double dip recessions that we had in the early 1980s, those were caused by very high inflation, the Federal Reserve aggressively raising interest rates, and that led to two recessions in quick success. Um, this time around, the ex recession that we experienced in 2020 was very different. It was caused by something external to the economy, the coronavirus pandemic. When we were talking last year, uh, we were discussing the potential for disruption from the pandemic, but we obviously did not realize how serious it would be. Uh, and it ended what had been the longest expansion in U.S. economic history. It had lasted more than 10 and a half years. It wasn't the world's strongest expansion but it was very lengthy. And in fact, we had made very good progress in reducing economic inequality towards the end of the previous expansion. Um, this chart shows median household income. Half of households earn above this, half of households earn below this. Um, you can see the previous uh, expansion started in 2009. In the early years of that expansion, we actually saw median household income falling. So even though the over Overall economy was growing, we didn't have income gains for the middle classes for lower income households. But by the time we got to the end of that expansion, we were seeing strong gains in median household income. Uh, the top 1%, the top 5% were benefiting from economic growth, but so were households in the middle of the income in, in income distribution, and then towards the lower end of the income distribution. And unfortunately, the, the pandemic caused that um, expansion to come to an end. Uh, we've seen a very aggressive response from the Federal Reserve in order to support economic growth. Uh, in the early stages of the pandemic, in March of 2020, we saw the Federal Reserve cut short-term interest rate, the Fed funds rate, their key short-term rate. They cut the interest rate uh, to zero. That brought down the interest rate for the federal government to borrow for three months, the three-month Treasury bill down to zero. And then the Fed decided that they needed to do more. Uh, so they cut long-term interest rates as well. They purchased long-term securities. They purchased mortgage-backed securities. So the interest rate on a 10-year Treasury bond, what it costs the federal government to borrow for 10 years, that was around 2% at this time last year. It fell well below 1% for most of 2020. Um, it's moved up a little bit since then. Uh, as of yesterday, it was at about 1.3, 1.4%, but still very, very low on a historical basis. And that's helped bring down long-term borrowing costs for businesses, for the federal government, for state and local governments, for households. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate is below 3% right now, and that's spurring a recovery in the housing market. And so the Fed has cut interest rates to very low levels in order to support economic growth. And that's contributed to the rebound that we are starting to see in the U.S. economy. Um, we also saw the stock market fall by about one third. Uh, the blue line is the S&P 500. That's a broad measure of stock prices um, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic. But since then, we've seen stock prices rise to record highs. The stock market is forward looking. It's not looking at conditions in February 2021 right now, but it's looking at the outlook for corporate profitability six months, nine months, 12 months for now. And it's safe to say that the stock market right now is pricing in a full recovery in corporate profitability, that investors do think that the economy will continue to improve and in particular corporate profits will continue to rise. And so the stock market is signaling that economic recovery will continue throughout 2021 into 2022. 
At the same time, volatility in the stock market remains high. If you look at the orange line, the VIX index, that's a measure of how much stock prices are moving up and down. Uh, you can see that we had a huge increase in volatility in the spring of 2020 as the pandemic came to the United States. It's fallen since then. It's been bouncing around depending on news about the pandemic, the election, stimulus plans, and so forth, but much lower than it was at this time last year. But that being said, volatility in the February of 2021 is still well above where it was for most of the preceding five years. And so I think that as things settle down, we will see volatility continue to fall, but we're likely to see elevated volatility at least for the next half year or so until it becomes clear what's going on with the vaccine, what's going on with the pandemic, what's going on with the economic recovery, what's going on with stimulus plans. Um, the pandemic has put about one half of the U.S. economy at risk. So let's look first at the factors of the U.S. economy that are less exposed to the pandemic. Government spending, the blue slice of the pie, that's about 17% of the U.S. economy. Uh, obviously, if anything, we've seen government spending increase. Um, this orange slice, that's consumer spending on non-durable goods. Those are goods that are meant to last fewer than three years. So that's things like food, clothing, and so forth. It's difficult to cut back on those types of purchases. Um, consumer spending on healthcare, housing, and utilities, that's about one-fifth of the U.S. economy. This green slice, uh, people still need to pay their rent or their mortgage. They still need to pay their electric bill. They still need to go to the physician or the dentist. So that type of spending is less less likely to be cut during the pandemic. But then there are other parts of the economy that are more exposed. Um, all other consumer services. So this is things like entertainment, travel, tourism. Um, it also includes personal care services, which is everything from child care uh, to dry cleaning, that, those types of things. Um, Consumers have made big cutbacks there as they're not traveling as much, they're not going out as much, and that's about one quarter of the U.S. economy. Uh, similarly, consumers spending on durables, cars, appliances, goods that are meant to last for more than three years, that's about 7% of the U.S. economy. It's easy for consumers to cut back on those purchases, at least for a period of time. Uh, and we did see uh, big cuts in durable goods spending during the initial stages of the pandemic. Uh, private investment, this red piece, a little less than one-fifth of the economy, that's investment in housing. It's also business investment, so commercial construction, information technology, software, uh, equipment, those types of things. And we did see big cutbacks in business investment. Businesses were highly uncertain about the outlook for the economy at this time last year. Uh, they weren't sure if their businesses would survive, and so they were uh, trying to preserve as much cash as they could, so they cut back on a lot lot of their investments. And then finally, exports, which is about 12% of the U.S. economy. Obviously, the pandemic has been global in nature, uh, and we did see a big drop in U.S. exports because of the pandemic, and so that was an area that was also heavily exposed. And so with all of this, we saw an enormous contraction in the U.S. economy in the first half of 2020. <clears throat> These are three measures of the size of the U.S. economy. Uh, gross domestic product, the blue line, that's the broadest measure we have, output of goods and services. Uh, what we call final sales of domestic product, the green line, uh, that is GDP minus the change in inventories. It measures demand for goods and services produced in the United States, whether that demand comes from within the United States or from abroad. And then finally, what we call gross domestic income. That's the income going to households from economic activity, uh, as well as the income going to businesses. And you can see that by any of these measures, we had an enormous contraction in the U.S. economy in the first half of 2020. Basically, output, production of goods and services in the United States, dropped by 10% from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the second quarter of 2020. To put that in context, if we go back to the Great Recession a dozen years or so ago, uh, that was a drop in GDP of 4 percent over a period of six quarters. So this was a much larger contraction in the U.S. economy over a much shorter period of time, simply unprecedented contraction in the U.S. economy. Now, the good news is, is that we have seen the economy pick back up again. We saw very strong economic growth in the third quarter of 2020, a little bit softer economic growth in the fourth quarter of 2020. So we've made up about three quarters of that initial decline 
decline in the US economy. The bad news is, is that we still have a long way to go. The economy at the end of 2020 was still about two and a half percent smaller than it was at the end of 2019. That's, you know, under normal circumstances, that would still be a pretty severe recession. And as you can notice, economic growth was definitely softer at the end of 2020 than it was in, in the fourth quarter of 2020 than it was in the third quarter of 2020. So it is going to take some time for the economy to get back to where it was before the pandemic. And I think this chart shows very well how some sectors of the economy have recovered and some sectors of the economy continue to lag. So if we look at consumer, the, first of all, the blue bars show the change between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020, while the orange bars show the change between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the fourth quarter of 2020, so basically over the past year. So for example, if we think about consumer spending on services, and this is adjusted for inflation, they fell about 15% in the first half of 2020. Consumers were spending about 15% less on services, all sorts of services, financial services, uh, travel, entertainment, restaurants, those types of things, than they had been spending at the end of 2019. Now, by the end of 2020, that consumer spending on services had made up some of that loss, but only about half of it. It was still down by about 7% from where it had been at the end of 2019. So still a long recovery to go in consumer services. But if you look at consumer spending on goods, either consumer durable goods meant to last for more than three years, things like cars and appliances, or consumer non-durable goods, uh, shorter period goods like food and clothing, um, you can see that those did fall initially by small declines in the early stages of the recession. But since then, they are now back above their pre-pandemic level. So people are buying a lot of cars. They're buying a lot of appliances. Um, they are uh, buying more food at the grocery store as opposed to going out to dinner. So the levels of spending in these areas is actually above where it was before the pandemic. If we look at business investment, this is investment in structures, investment in equipment, uh, investment in information technology, um, that fell by about 10% in the first half of 2020 when the pandemic came. But now it's basically back to where it was before the pandemic. So we do have businesses starting to invest again. Uh, look at residential investment, that's investment in housing. That fell by about six or 7% initially, but now it's up almost 15% from before the pandemic. Uh, with mortgage rates below 3%, with people looking to move out of apartments into single family homes, looking to move out of the, sub, uh, the city into the suburbs, we've seen a very strong rebound in, in the housing market. Uh, housing starts are basically back to where they were before the pandemic. Uh, existing home sales are well above their pre-pandemic level. So the housing market has been a real source of strength for the economy uh, in the second half of 2020, and that's likely to persist throughout 2021. Um, government consumption and investment, this isn't necessarily government spending. Uh, this is government spending. On, so for example, this doesn't include the, the stimulus checks that households receive. It's what we call government consumption and investment. So that's either government salaries and supplies or government investment goods like government construction, military supplies, that type of thing. You can see that that rose initially in the early stages of the pandemic, now down a little bit, but, but you know, not much going on. On there. Um, but look what happened at the international sector. Exports fell by about one quarter from uh, the fourth quarter of 2019 to the second quarter of 2020. Um, since then, we've had a rebound in, in exports, but they're still down more than 10% from where we were before the pandemic. Again, the pandemic has been global in nature. We've seen disruptions in supply chains. Uh, a lot of the exports of the United States exports are services. That includes things like you know, movies and intellectual property that cons people consume abroad. Consumption of that is down. Also, travel to the United States is down. Down, and that's included in exports. And so we still have a big drop in exports relative to where we were before the pandemic. We also had a big drop in imports originally uh, in the first half of 2020 as supply chains were disrupted, as people were buying fewer goods from abroad. Uh, but with this big spending on goods, uh, consumer spending on goods uh, in the second half of 2020, um, now ex imports are basically back to where they were before the pandemic. And what that means is with 
exports down a lot with imports barely down, we saw a big increase in the trade deficit, the United States trade deficit in the second half of 2020. And then finally, this may be the most important thing, personal income. This is the income going to households in the United States. Uh, between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the second quarter of 2020, we saw personal income increase almost 10%. What's going on there? This is at a time when the US economy had lost more than 22 million jobs. But at the same point, we had huge amounts of transfers going from the government to households. So we had the one-time stimulus payments that many households received in April and May of 2020. Uh, we made more people eligible for unemployment insurance, the self-employed, independent contractors, gig workers like Uber and Lyft drivers. And then also the federal government increased unemployment unemployment insurance benefits going to households. Uh, uh, unemployment insurance beneficiaries were receiving an extra $600 per week in unemployment. What that means is even at the same time that the economy was losing tens of millions of jobs and people's income from the labor market was going down, transfers from the government more than made up from that. And we had much higher incomes in the second half of 2020 than we had at the end of 2019. And that's what's allowed consumers to increase their spending on all sorts of goods. And that's what's been driving the recovery in the housing market is households having more money to spend on new homes, to furnish those new homes, that type of thing. So it's this increase in personal income that has made an enormous difference and has supported the recovery that is underway in the United States right now. Now, if you look here, you can see that since the second quarter of 2020, we did see personal income fall in the second half of 2020, still above where it was before the pandemic, but we did have the end of those one-time stimulus payments and so forth. Now, it's likely to increase again in early 2021 with the stimulus payments that many households received in, in January, um, but it's this increase in household income that has allowed for the economic recovery that is underway to get started. Um, the disruption to the labor market from the pandemic has been simply unprecedented. Uh, so this is employment in the United States. You can see that uh, between February and April, the US economy lost 22 million jobs in just two months. To put that in context, during the Great Recession, the US economy lost about 8 million jobs over a period of two years. So these are much larger job losses over a much shorter period of time. Now, since the enormous loss of those 22 million jobs, we've added back more than 12 million jobs. Uh, but important caveat, you can see that most of those job gains came in the first few months uh, of the recovery, um, that over the past three months, the US economy has only added about 29,000 jobs on average. So obviously, at that pace, it would take decades for employment to get back to its pre-recession level. Um, so we got a lot of job growth in the early stages of the recovery, uh, kind of the low hanging fruit as businesses reopen. Uh, but now with more permanent uh, business closures, with uh, more permanent losses in demand, we've seen much slower job growth in recent months with rising cases of the coronavirus. We've seen a re uh, resumption of layoffs in industries like restaurants, hotels, that type of thing. Um, and so we have seen much weaker job growth recently than we saw in the early stages of the recovery. And basically, we're only back to 2015 levels of employment. So we've you know wiped out five or six years of job gains, and we still have a long way to go to make up that. And I think this chart shows very clearly what's happened in the labor market. This is what we call the employment to population ratio. This is the share of adults 16 and over who are working. This is as much data as we have that goes back to 1948, just after the end of World War II. Um, you can see that before the pandemic, that employment to population ratio was about 61%. 61% uh, of adults were working. That fell to 51% in April, by far the lowest ever on record. Now, we saw a bounce back. It's now up to about 57% or so. Um, so we've put a lot of people back to work, but we still have about 3.5% of the adult population 
that was employed before the pandemic that is not employed now. So there's still a long, long way to go, and it's tough to see here, but basically this employment to population ratio has been flat in recent months. So we still have a long ways to go. Um, that employment to population ratio, basically only back to 1970s, 19, early 1980s levels, if you think about all of the enormous changes we've had in the job market since then, the entrance of baby boomers into very large numbers into the job market, the entrance of women into very large numbers in the labor force. We have basically wiped out all of that progress with the pandemic and we still have a very, very long way to go before we get back to that point. Um, so I've talked about some of the problems that the economy faces, but I am fairly optimistic about the outlook for 2021 and then uh, 2022. A uh, big reason why is that consumers are actually in pretty good shape. Um, so the blue line is the personal savings rate. That's uh, the share of after-tax income that households are saving. Um, even before the pandemic, that personal savings rate was about 7% or so. If you look before the Great Recession, that personal savings rate was three and a half or 4%. So even before the pandemic, households were saving more. They had more of a cushion. And then you can see this enormous spike up in the personal savings rate uh, in the initial stages of the pandemic in the late spring, summer of 2020. What was going on there? Well, first of all, households had all that extra income from the government in extra unemployment insurance benefits and stimulus payments. So they had more money also, they didn't have as they weren't spending nearly as much money, right? We showed those big drops in consumer spending. So we saw that personal savings rate get up to about 26% in the second quarter of 2020. Now it's fallen since then, but still well above its long run average. So households have been saving a lot of money, which means as the weather gets better, as coronavirus cases continue to decline, as more people is, are vaccinated and they feel get comfortable going out, they have a lot of savings that they will be able to spend through the rest of 2021 into 2022. Similarly, if we look at the financial obligations ratio, the orange line on the right-hand scale, uh, that's the share of after-tax income that goes to regular financial payments. So it's mortgage payments, it's rent for renters, it's credit card payments, student loans, auto loans and leases, uh, homeowners insurance, property taxes, those kinds of things. Um, you can see again that even before the pandemic, that financial obligations ratio was far lower than it was before the Great Recession a dozen years or so ago, uh, people had less mortgage debt, they'd refinance their debt at lower rates and so forth. Um, and then that financial obligations ratio plunged uh, in 2020 as the pandemic hit. Again, part of it was more income, uh, but again, part of it was is that consumers were able to refinance their mortgages uh, with those stimulus payments. They were able to pay off their credit card bills and so forth. Um, and so again, consumer balance sheets are in excellent shape. And that means that consumers do have the ability to increase their spending in 2021 as the economy gets better, as they feel more comfortable going out, as we get uh, closer to herd immunity. Um, business side is a little more mixed than on the consumer side. Um, the blue line is the debt of non-financial corporations as a share of GDP. Uh, you can see that even before the pandemic, that was at a record high. Businesses had taken on a lot of debt. Um, and then it rose even further. Uh, this is as businesses drew down on lines of credit ahead of the pandemic to make sure that they had enough cash uh, as they got uh, paycheck protection program loans from the federal government. Um, and so we saw that uh, debt is a share of the size of economy move even higher. It's fallen somewhat since then, but still very elevated, still uh, far above where it was uh, over the past 50, 60 years or so. That being said, however, interest rates are extremely low for corporations. So if you look at interest payments as a share of non-financial corporate cash flow, that's actually very low right now. 
Businesses, again, they've refinanced their debt at lower rates. Uh, and so businesses, although they have a lot of debt, they're not having difficulty in 2020, 2021 in servicing that debt as of now. Uh, and so um, although we are watching the level of corporate debt, uh, low interest rates does give businesses some flexibility. And so I do not think that, that corporate debt right now is a threat to the expansion that is underway. Uh, we have gotten $3 trillion in stimulus from the federal government uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, small business loans and grants, that's primarily the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that is very low interest loans to small and medium sized businesses. Um, uh, those loans will turn into grants if they meet certain requirements in terms of keeping workers on their payrolls, maintaining pay levels and so forth. And businesses right now are in the process of applying for uh, loan forgiveness from the Paycheck Protection Program. I'm on the board of directors of a small nonprofit here in Pittsburgh and we're in the process of doing that. But that's more than a trillion dollars in aid to small and medium sized businesses. Uh, big business and government loans and guarantees, uh, primarily aid to the airlines, which have suffered tremendously. Um, those stimulus payments. So this includes the stimulus payments that households received both in early 2020 and then again in early 2021. Uh, more than $400 billion in those stimulus payments that's allowed many households to maintain their spending even with the pandemic. Uh, Unemployment insurance benefits, an extra almost $400 billion in unemployment insurance benefits from expanded eligibility from increased benefits. And so again, that's allowed households with unemployed workers to maintain their spending even with the pandemic. Uh, aid for our health system, business tax cuts, aids to states. Um, all of this has allowed for a rebound in economic activity uh, since the worst in the, the spring of 2020. And as allowed for an improvement in many measures of the economy. Um, that Paycheck Protection Program I mentioned has been very important. Uh, this is from PNC's Small Business Survey. We conduct this twice a year. This is from our Fall 2020 survey. We'll be releasing the results from our Spring 2021 survey uh, over the next week or so. Um, but you can see that of the small and medium-sized businesses in our survey that had applied for a Paycheck Protection Program loan, 97% uh, of them said it was an important to their business, including 69% that it was extremely important to their business. So that's allowed many businesses that might have had to have closed to remain open uh, through the worst of the pandemic and, and get through this enormous economic dislocation that we've experienced. Um, and small and medium sized businesses, however, do say that we, uh, we do need more aid from the federal government. Um, so this is the importance of additional stimulus funding to small and medium sized businesses. Again, this is from the fall of 2020. So this was before we got the latest package that was passed at the end of 2020. Um, but 32% additional said 32% said additional aid was extremely important. 22% uh, said additional aid was somewhat important. So more than half of the businesses expressed the need for additional aid from the federal government. Um, we, the federal government has taken on a lot of debt. Uh, we've seen federal spending increase enormously. Uh, federal revenues down a little bit from before the pandemic. But don't forget that interest costs are exceedingly low right now. The federal government can borrow for basically for short periods of time at zero interest. They can borrow for 10 years at about 1.3% interest. So borrowing costs are extremely low for the federal government right now. So it makes sense for the government to borrow the funds to support a strong economic recovery. At some point, we will need to address our nation's long-term fiscal challenges in terms of how to pay for the retirement of the baby boomers through Social Security and Medicare, how to invest in infrastructure, national defense, those types of things. But it's a lot easier to do that if we have a strong economy, a strong recovery, than if we have a weak economy. So it makes sense to make investments now that will allow for a stronger economy over the longer run and will better allow us to address those long-term funding challenges. Um, and you know, it's important to recognize that there is still a lot of risk out there. Um, according to our fall 2020 small business survey, one third of small and medium sized businesses said that they could operate for less than one year under current economic conditions. 
uh, 16% said they could uh, survive for less than six months under current economic conditions. So it's very important that we invest now, that we, we allow these small and medium-sized businesses to remain open. Um, what we don't want to have is have small and medium-sized businesses that are viable over the longer run have to close down in the short term because of the pandemic, because of the economic dislocation, uh, because that would make the recovery much weaker. It would do long run damage to the US economy. Uh, we've seen a very aggressive response from the Federal Reserve, as I mentioned. They cut short-term interest rates to zero. They decided that wasn't enough, so they've been cutting long-term interest rates as well by purchasing long-term securities. Uh, this is Federal Reserve Holdings. These other treasuries, those are longer-term treasuries, so that's pushed down borrowing costs. Uh, they've increased their holdings of mortgage-backed securities. That's pushed mortgage rates down. Again, that 30-year fixed rate mortgage is below 3%. And so that's allowed businesses to borrow at very low cost. It's allowed governments to borrow at very low cost. It's allowed consumers to borrow at very low cost. It's pushed mortgage rates below 3% that's allowed for support in the housing market. So this has been very important to the recovery that is underway. Um, and I don't think that we should be worried about inflation. I still don't, I don't think that these Federal Reserve efforts at all of this stimulus is going to be inflationary. Uh, this is what we call five-year, five-year forward inflation expectations. This is what financial markets are telling us inflation is going to be five years to 10 years from now, the annual average of inflation. So basically, right now, investors think that inflation between 2026 and 2031 will average about 2% per year, okay? Now, the Fed has actually been concerned that inflation in the United States is below, is too low, excuse me. The Fed has set an inflation objective of 2%, and throughout most of the recovery from the Great Recession, we've seen inflation well below 2%. So the Fed would like inflation to move to 2%, and in fact, move a little bit above 2%. And financial markets do not think that inflation is a problem right now. For many businesses, it's difficult to raise prices, particularly service industries where demand is down so much. We are seeing higher prices for some types of goods, um, uh, home building materials, things like that. But generally, inflation remains low. Uh, wage pressures are going to remain limited with high unemployment. Uh, and so I would expect that inflation is going to remain below the Fed's 2% objective for another year or two, and then move a little bit above 2%, but that's okay. That's what the Fed wants. I don't think that worries about inflation should deter the, Fed, the Federal Reserve from acting. I don't think worries about inflation should deter the federal government from implementing another big stimulus package. Um, so there is a lot of uncertainty about the U.S. economy right now. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's um, certainly much more so than usual. But here's what I'm pretty sure about. The first is, is that we experienced a very steep recession in 2020, but that a recovery did start in 2020 as well. Now, a recovery does not mean that the economy is good. It just means that the economy is growing again, and it is bigger now than it was in the second quarter of 2020. We saw the unemployment rate, which was 3.5% in February before the pandemic. That jumped to 14.8% in April. It's now down to 6.3% as of January. Um, still well above where it was before the recession. So unemployment is still a significant issue, but it's not nearly as bad as it was back in April. Inflation will remain low, as I mentioned, because of limited wage pressures and a limited ability of businesses to raise prices. Um, and that we are seeing structural shifts take place in the US economy. So for example, even before the pandemic, households were buying a lot more online, less in traditional brick and retail, uh, brick and mortar stores. That process intensified with the pandemic and that's not going away. Consumers will continue to buy more online and less from traditional retailers. Um, we've seen changes to supply chains. Businesses have seen what happens when they don't have enough inventory. So they're keeping more supply on hand. Uh, and they're looking to some more source more supply from within the United States as opposed to abroad because of the disruptions we've seen in international supply chains. Uh, and then finally, we're seeing shifts in commercial real estate markets. So in addition to the, the change in demand for retail, which has reduced 
demand for retail space even more. Um, you know, I think we're likely to see changes in, in demand for office space. Uh, many of us continue to work from home. Uh, it's unclear what's going to happen to office space going forward, whether we'll need as much office space going forward as we've had in the past. Uh, I do think that some people will uh, continue to work at home after the pandemic is over, but I think we are going to see structural shifts in commercial real estate markets. Um, what I'm less sure about is the shape of the recovery this year. So are we going to see a big, you know, a V, a very sharp rebound? Are we going to see a U, a more gradual rebound, that Nike swoosh, which is an even weaker recovery? There's also the potential for a, a W, a further contraction in the economy. I think that's diminished in, in recent weeks with falling cases of the coronavirus and, and um, rollout of the vaccine. But certainly that potential is out there if we see new variants of the virus that are less um, um, uh, the uh, transmission is, is not reduced as much by the vaccine and so forth. So certainly that potential is out there. Not saying it's going to happen, but it, it's out there. Um, how effective the Paycheck Protection Program is and, and how, many bus how many business failures we get, the more business failures, uh, the slower the recovery. Uh, whether we'll get future stimulus. Uh, the Biden administration is looking at a $1.9 trillion package. The House, I think, is set to vote on it this week, but we'll see what happens with that. Uh, how quickly the labor market improves and how quickly the unemployment rate falls. Um, the longer run impact on growth, um, the longer the pandemic persists, the more structural changes we have in the economy, the greater the damage to the economy and the weaker long run economic growth would be. And then finally, the impact on the housing market. As I mentioned, we're seeing a housing market boom. The question is, are those shifts going to uh, persist? Are we going to continue to see people moving from apartments into single family homes uh, from the city into the suburbs? Or if we get a vaccine, will people, uh, that, those trends come to an end and, and people resume wanting to live in cities? Um, and what matters is, first of all, the public health response, getting the vaccine out efficiently. Um, until people feel comfortable going out in public, uh, we will not have a strong economic recovery. So that's what matters most importantly. Um, how much more stimulus? I would much rather err on the side of too much stimulus than too little stimulus. I think stimulus should focus on three efforts. Uh, one is supporting small and medium-sized businesses so that we don't have permanent business closures. Uh, two is aid to households so that they can maintain their spending even with continued elevated unemployment. And then third is aid to state and local governments. Uh, many state governments, local governments have seen their revenue sources decline. Uh, at the same time, they have higher costs associated with the pandemic. So I am concerned that without additional support from the federal government that they would need to make spending and job cuts in the second half of 2021 and then in 2022 that could really weigh on the recovery that is underway now. Um, and then finally, business assistance. Uh, you know, We do need that aid to small and medium-sized businesses so that we don't see uh, permanent business closures, that businesses can limp through the, the down turn that we're experiencing now and then reopen on the other side of this, uh, the more permanent business closures we have, the greater the long run damage to the US economy. Um, so this is actually our January forecast. We're updating our February forecast. That will be out later this week. Keep an eye out for that. Um, but you can see this enormous contraction that we had in the US economy in the first half of 2020. Um, we do expect to see a strong rebound in 2021. First quarter is going to be a little bit weak because of the increase in coronavirus cases that we saw at the beginning of the year. Uh, the bad weather that we've experienced in much of the country is also going to be a drag on growth. Uh, but I do think that growth will be much stronger in the second, third, and fourth quarters of this year as vaccine distribution continues as uh, we see coronavirus cases to continue to decline, as we get uh, warmer weather, and then as we get additional stimulus from the federal government. Um, the unemployment rate, which I mentioned, peaked at close to 15% in April, was down to a little bit above 6% uh, at, in January. Um, I would think that it's going to end this year at around um, five and a half percent or so, uh, and then in 2022 at about 5%. But that's still a long ways from that three and a half percent unemployment rate that we had at the beginning of 2020 before the pandemic. Um, and it's going to take a long time to make up lost ground. So this shows various measures of the economy. I set the peak in uh, 2019 before the pandemic equal to 100. Uh, real GDP, I think we'll be back to our previous level of real GDP by the end of this year. 
Um, business fixed investment, we're going to see stronger growth there because of low borrowing costs, because of businesses needs to in invest coming out of the pandemic. Uh, employment is going to be a slower recovery. We may not achieve the same number of jobs that we had before the pandemic until 2023 or 2024. Uh, similarly, with what we call industrial production, that's output of manufacturers, mines, utilities, a little bit slower recovery there than in the overall economy. Uh, and then finally, housing starts. I mentioned that's been a real source of growth. And so housing starts in 2021 will be well above their pre-pandemic level in large part because of those very low mortgage rates that we have right now. Um, let's take a look at regional economic conditions. This is the Philadelphia Fed's coincident index. Uh, this measures conditions uh, across states. This is from February 2020 before the pandemic. You can see that generally most states were in the green expansion category. Pennsylvania, a little bit slower growth, but generally solid conditions throughout the United States. Uh, this is the Philadelphia Fed's coincident index from May. Uh, all red, all in that very deep contraction category. Uh, this is really odd because usually even during significant downturns in the US economy, there are some states that are doing better than others, some states that are expanding. That was not the case this time around. We had a pandemic that affect in a economic downturn, not just in the United States, but globally, but very broad based contraction throughout the United States. This is the latest coincident index from December of 2020. Um, you can see that except for a few isolated states, conditions are generally uh, positive. We're seeing growth in the United States economy at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Uh, Pennsylvania, a little bit softer than some other states, but still an improvement, uh, you know, gains in employment, declines in the unemployment rate and so forth. Um, this is, uh, shows employment for the United States, Pennsylvania, and then the Pittsburgh air, metro area, Allegheny, Armstrong, Beaver, Butler, Fayette, Washington, and Westmoreland counties. I set the peak equal to the recession, equal to 100. Um, you can see that the declines in employment in Pittsburgh and in the Pennsylvania were larger than the national average. So nationally, employment fell by about 14%. Uh, in the Pittsburgh metro area, it fell by about 18%. Uh, and that the recovery in the Pittsburgh metro area has been a little bit weaker. Um, this is in part because the state of Pennsylvania has imposed more restrictions on economic activity than some other states. Um, and you can see that we have had a little bit uh, of, of job losses in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania in recent months, uh, consistent with what we're seeing nationally. So a little bit slower recovery in Pittsburgh relative to, to the national economy. That being said, I do think the structural damage for the pandemic is likely to be smaller in Pittsburgh than it is nationally. Um, this is the share of employment in oil and gas mining and production, air transportation and leisure hospitality services in 2019. These are the industries that are most exposed to permanent changes because of the pandemic. Um, in the Pittsburgh metro area, that's about 10.7% in total employment compared to about 11.4% nationally. So Pittsburgh has less exposure to those industries, more exposure to industries like education and healthcare, financial services, those types of industries that are overall less exposed to the overall pandemic. Um, this is our small business survey results for Pennsylvania compared to the United States from the fall of 2020. Um, you can see that uh, uh, Pennsylvania businesses are a little less optimistic about businesses nationally for both sales and for profits. Um, and so, you know, I think some of that is the greater restrictions, some of it was slower economic growth in, in uh, Pennsylvania before the pandemic uh, relative to the nation. But a little bit less optimistic. And then finally, and I show this chart every year, but this is very important. Uh, this is population growth. And you can see that for most of the past couple of decades, the population in the Pittsburgh metropolitan area has actually been declining, uh, whereas it's been growing in the United States and has been flat basically in Pennsylvania uh, over the past six or seven years ago. Um, you know, businesses are looking for workers. They are looking for consumers. And if population in the Pittsburgh metropolitan area is declining, that is going to make it difficult to attract businesses. And it becomes a chicken and egg problem. Businesses don't come here because of declining population. That means more people move out in search of opportunities elsewhere, and that makes it more difficult to attract businesses. So this is going to be the key to stronger long-run economic growth in Pittsburgh.
Um, I would encourage you to look at all of our materials at pnc.com slash economic reports. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at Gus Fauche PNC. Uh, and then are, are we taking questions? Okay. Yeah, I have some questions here. So uh, I'll just read them to you and, okay. then, and then you can respond. So the, the first question we had is, um, inflation appears to be occurring in pockets of the economy driven by higher labor costs and supply chain constraints. Where do you see this occurring and not within the Pittsburgh region? Um, yeah, so that's a very good question. As I mentioned, I think overall inflation uh, concerns are, are fairly limited. Um, you know, certainly there are um, goods, uh, you know, generally uh, prices have increased more for goods than for services. Uh, as I showed, the demand for services is still way down from before the recession while demand for goods is up. Um, so we've seen home values increasing dramatically, building materials involved in home renovations. Um, we've seen uh, food prices increase more than the average because people are eating at home more and eating out less. Um, that being being said, prices are down in a lot of areas, you know, particularly for services. Um, uh, you know, hotel rates are down, airfares are down because of a lot of excess capacity. So I think generally it's goods that are experiencing stronger price increases than services. Um, and, you know, I also think that in, in some areas we have seen uh, labor costs increase because uh, some workers are concerned about getting the coronavirus so they're not returning to work. And so that's caused employers to, to, to bid up wages. I think as we get vaccinated, labor costs are be going to become less of a pressing concern uh, as more people feel comfortable comfortable going out and working and as, and as uh, particularly as, as children return to school and we have a lot of working mothers who are staying home now go back out into the labor force. Uh, the next question was, uh, can you comment on the tri-states, uh, PA, West Virginia and Ohio, uh, energy and natural gas industry decline? Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, there, there are a number of factors that are going on there. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, as we've seen, and, and this is a chart that I used to show, I, I'm, I'm not showing it now, but um, you know, we've seen the price of natural gas fall structurally because of developments in fracking and so forth. That in turn has pushed down coal prices as well. And so we've seen a huge decline in coal mining. Some of it's regulatory, more of it is because of natural gas and the substitution of much less expensive natural gas for coal. Um, you know, I, I think that um, now we have structurally lower demand for energy in the United States because of the pandemic. Overall, the economy is smaller. Uh, we have people are driving less, people are flying less. Uh, and so we've seen a decline in energy demand, and that's pushed down energy prices as well. Um, and so that's been a drag on the you know, greater Appalachian area where a lot of this shale gas drilling has taken place. Um, and we've seen a lot less development activity. Um, some of it, again, some of it is regulatory. I, you know, we, uh, the Biden administration has talked about uh, banning drilling on federal lands. Um, but I, I do think that we are in a world of structurally lower energy prices now because of a number of factors, because of the development of new technologies, uh, both fracking, but also uh, in advances in solar and wind. Uh, because many businesses um, are shifting to uh, more renewable sources of energy uh, supply. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't expect energy prices to get back to where they were before the pandemic anytime soon. And in particular, you know, the shale industry is very responsive to price trends. So if we start to see prices creep up again, then we'll get more drilling activity that will push prices down. So I think that we're in a world of structurally lower energy costs now compared to where we were 15, 20 years or so. So ago, uh, and I don't think we're going to go back to that world of higher energy prices. Uh, do you foresee a federal program for low cost funding in the next year to initiate new business ventures in the manufacturing and industrial sectors? Um, I, I think the focus on business aid right now is focus on businesses that are actually uh, existing now, but um, are in trouble because of the pandemic, because of re reduced demand. So I think that the focus in the near term is going to be on supporting businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program. We just had another round of PPP funding. We'll see uh, what comes out of the new stimulus bill. Uh, but I think in, in the short run, it's much more important to help the small and medium-sized businesses that are struggling now get through the worst of the pandemic, come through on the other side and, and you know, remain open. Then once we get through that, we'll look at long-term business development. Uh, but I think the focus right now is going to be on existing small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, what do you see specifically for the economic recovery of cities, urban areas, including Pittsburgh? Yeah, and that's a, you know, that's a good question. And, and I think that that is still very uh, open right now. Um, I think the big 
question mark there is what happens with the pandemic. Uh, if it recedes, if it gets to the point where uh, at the end of 2021 that people are not wearing masks, that people are returning to their offices downtown, um, that people feel comfortable taking public transportation, uh, then I think that the, the outlook for cities is good. And I still think that there are many people who enjoy the uh, benefits of living in a city. Um, if we continue to have problems with the pandemic, the virus, and, and people don't feel comfortable, then I think we're going to see a movement away from cities. Um, the other thing is that I do think that the um, trend towards working from home, the trend towards lo remote locations could benefit areas like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has lower business costs than some of the other business centers. Uh, and so if you are a business and you're headquartered in New York, uh, you may be looking at this and saying, well, we can pay New York salaries or we can pay Pittsburgh salaries, but people now have the technological capacity to work in Pittsburgh. Uh, that may be uh, provide a reason for businesses to move some of their workers away from higher cost business centers to lower cost business centers. Center. So we may see shifts within cities uh, as the recovery continues away from higher cost cities and, and more towards lower cost cities that have good infrastructure, uh, but lower costs and still have a skilled workforce. Uh, the next question is uh, interested to hear your thoughts regarding uneven recovery in certain occupations, for example, retail and food versus information technology, which has seen some growth um, since uh, last March. Yeah, and, and I think I showed this pretty clearly that there are some industries that are really suffering. Uh, service industries continue to, to have much lower demand than they did before the pandemic. Uh, Export-oriented industries continue to have much lower demand. On the other hand, there are other um, industries that are doing much better. So, uh, you know, uh, consumer durables, heavy manufacturing, that type of thing. Business investment is back. Housing-related industries are doing well. Um, if you're a construction worker, this is a great time. Um, if you're a restaurant worker, this is a very, very difficult time. And I think, again, until we get a handle on the pandemic, that those uh, disparities are likely to remain in place. Um, it is fair to say that this recession has hit lower wage workers harder. It's hit lower skilled workers harder. It's hit uh, minorities harder than it's hit whites. It's hit women harder than it hits men because of the industrial shifts that we've seen. And these industrial shifts, I mean, normally we have uh, recessions cause industrial shifts, but these industrial shifts in this recession have been much greater than what we've seen in previous recessions. And so there's, those disparities are, are magnified. I'm hopeful that if we get a vaccine that we'll start to see recoveries in these industries and that those workers will start to benefit from it. Uh, but it does raise questions about uh, long run economic growth, um, income inequality, that type of thing. Uh, this might be a follow up with that is how do educational institutions and others other help those in underperforming parts of the economy pivot to where strong opportunities, job opportunities exist. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, we we are going to need different, and, and this was the case before the pandemic, we need different skills uh, in 2025 than we needed in 2000 or 1990. Uh, we continue to move away from, despite this, we continue to move away from uh, goods more towards services. Uh, business investment is going to be a big driver of economic growth over the longer run. Um, and so we need workers who are trained for 21st century jobs. We need workers who are trained in information technology. Uh, we need workers who are trained uh, trained in advanced manufacturing uh, techniques. And so I think it's incumbent of the educational institutions, I think particularly in the Pittsburgh area where we have a lot of very good uh, educational institutions to make sure that we're training our workers for, for 21st century jobs and not 20th century jobs. Okay, and, and so our last question here is, uh, since travel and entertainment has been hit so hard, why are some approved programs not released like the Save Our Venues Act? Uh, do you know when those initiatives will be released or status of those? Um, I, you know, I'm not as familiar with that. I mean, I think it is fair to say that uh, the uh, entertainment industry, I know, has taken an enormous hit. Obviously, people uh, do not feel comfortable in, in, in large gatherings and that they continue to be restrictions on those. Um, I certainly think that that's something that the uh, 
Biden administration should be looking at. That I mean, you know, we have a lot of infrastructure in those industries. Um, if those industries don't come back, that in infrastructure goes to waste. We need to have new industries arise to take their place. So it makes sense to invest again to, so that there are businesses that are viable, that have business models that are viable over the longer run that don't have to shut down in the short run uh, because of the pandemic. And, and then those closures become permanent and we need to you know, have new businesses arise to take their place, new infrastructure that just delays the recovery and results in slower long run economic growth. All right. Well, thank you, Gus. This has been an excellent uh, presentation and program. Um, on behalf of the IEE, I'd like to thank Gus, um, Lucy Stello from PNC, Stephanie, Stephanie Pashman, uh, Rich Fitzgerald, uh, Secretary Davin, and uh, uh, Dr. Rob Rutenbar. Uh, this will conclude our program.